Hello and welcome back to Greater Somerville for March 23rd, 2022. I'm Joe Lynch. It is my pleasure for this reboot of Greater Somerville after a little bit of a hiatus. And I am looking forward to an exciting year ahead. But what better person to have as the first guest for the reboot here live in the studios as the man of the hour less than uh, 48 hours ago, 72 hours ago, the first of the seven Green Line stops opened officially on Monday, March 21st. My guest is a repeat guest here. He is the general manager of the GLX extension from Cambridge into Medford, John Dalton. John Dalton, it's been, we just calculated, it's four years since we've been in studio, then we did another show, and then we did a virtual show, and now you're back. That's right. Here's the big question. You just spent $2.3 billion. How does that feel to spend that amount of money on the Green Line extension? Joe, uh, first, <laughs> it's great to be back with you. It's really nice to be in person and be talking to your listeners again, so thanks for having me back. Um, it feels great, however, one, one caveat, we were actually under budget at the moment, so we have not spent the 2.3 and we will not be spending 2.3. I feels opened good. that door for you so you could say I came <laughs> in under budget. Well done, thank you. You are, um, I jokingly said to you in one of your appearances that you were the most loved man in Somerville. How does it feel for all of that love that you saw on Monday at the opening? You went from Leechmere to the Union Square T-Stop. You want to describe it for the viewers? Yeah, I mean, it felt great. I mean, what it really reminded me of was just how long people in this, in this region, in this neighborhood, have been waiting for this. I mean, I think in the day-to-day -day of delivering the project, you get so sort of, you get tunnel vision on just the day-to-day -day execution. And oftentimes, the larger history of the project, you're not thinking about. But Monday's event was really um, a reminder of just the, the, the passion and the want and the need that people have for this project. So it was a real, it was a real special day in a lot of ways. We've seen the media center covered it and I watched some of their news, uh, their news reels, but you had almost every major station in the New England area that was covering that because it is a big deal. It's a big deal not only for the city of Somerville, city of Cambridge, city of Medford, it's a big deal for all the workers who spent the last X number of years working on it. It's a big deal for the electeds I think we had to have um, EMTs for some of them. They were patting themselves on the back and they probably dislocated their shoulders. John didn't say it, I did. Um, <laughs> but more importantly, I think you're absolutely right that the enthusiasm and the excitement that was shown on Monday was really evident in the day-to-day -day person who had participated in meetings, who had advocated for that. The ridership, mm -hmm. I mean, you started ridership right at what, five o'clock in the morning? 4.52 that morning, that's right. 4.52 that morning, and I assume it wasn't just all the politicos, it was people no. who knew you were no. gonna open the station. There were people waiting outside the gate of the station the moment we opened, and they were ready to get on. That's terrific. Oh yeah. I'm gonna give you the congratulations, and then I'm gonna backtrack because there's five more stations to go. So Monday was a spectacular event for uh, the three communities who had been waiting for this. You successfully reopened the relocated Leechmere and successfully opened transit between Union Square and Leechmere. For those who are uh, not familiar with the history, it started eons ago. Some people will tell you it started you know, back in 1930, other people will tell you 1990, other people will tell you, you know, it really didn't jumpstart until sometime in early 2000. But here we are 23, year, 23 years, 22 years later, um, and it's a reality. And what can I can see, I live, John knows I live abutting one of the news stations. What I can see is it's moving at a rapid clip. So let's talk about a little bit about what the expectations are that you have. Um, you know, the, the project is a $2.3 billion, um, how many miles, John? Uh, 4.7. 4.7 miles, seven stations, serving hundreds of thousands of commuters. It, it's a magnificent project. It only adds to what we're looking for in the urban environment. Public transportation, clean transportation, uh, on-time transportation, getting rid of cars off the road. So it fulfills a lot of people's dream. The next part is gonna be uh, 
probably not covered by so many mm -hmm. cameras, mm -hmm. but why don't you take us through some of the stuff that you had to go through, particularly when it comes to the pandemic. You got a little bit of an interruption there, but congratulations on bringing it in only, what, two months, three months, over. Yeah. When you were here last, you said December of 2021. Mm -hmm. March of 2022 is spectacular. It was only two and a half months. Well, it, it, thank you, Joe. I mean, it was, um, we would have liked to have stuck with that December 2021 date, um, but admittedly, COVID-19 was definitely an unforeseen curveball we had to, we had to manage. Um, <clears throat> and before I say anything else, I just want to, again, give credit to the, the men and women on those work crews who, who, who came to work every day, every night, weekdays, weekends, in the darkest, most you know, uncertain days of the pandemic when most of us were at home working remotely on, you know, learning to work on Zoom and, you know, had some, had some level of security working from our homes. And these people came to work every single day. And it is without question, we would not have been meet, meeting that milestone on Monday without those people coming to work on those days. So um, the pandemic definitely impacted us. Um, and, you know, there, there were some silver linings, believe it or not, with COVID-19 on, on GLX. Uh, the challenges were, we had some real supply chain impacts because um, again, we were pulling materials from lots and lots of different places. Some places were even overseas and you know, COVID-19 had spot, hot spots that were moving around all the time and we were mostly impacted by most of them in some form or fashion. Um, so we had to deal with those challenges and also there were some inefficiencies on site, you know, s social distancing, sanitizing equipment and those all kind of cut into the, the, the efficiencies of the work site. So, those are, the, those are the downside impacts. The positive sides were, if I can call them that, um, there were certainly less road traffic. So, you know, as you know, Joe, there were a lot of road closures, bridge closures as part of GLX. Um, we worked a lot with the city of Somerville from, from the beginning um, and asked an awful lot for closing certain roads at certain times, bridges that were adjacent to one another, you know, had big impacts on traffic patterns. That had traffic been kind of pre-COVID the whole way through, we perhaps would not have gotten some of those bridge closure requests that we ultimately did, uh, where we were granted by the cities. Um, so that was sort of a, a, a benefit. The other thing was, you know, during the peak of the pandemic, ridership on the MT MBTA dropped considerably. Uh, and as you know, you know, we we're building the GLX um, adjacent to two existing commuter rail lines. The Fitchburg line parallels the Union Square branch and the, Med uh, the, Med the uh, uh, New Hampshire main line parallels the Medford branch. Both of those saw substantial reductions in traffic and in, in ridership and therefore it dialed back the amount of trains that ran every day. <clears throat> so, I was going to ask you that. So the decreased ridership allowed the commuter rail system to decrease the amount of trains running parallel to where you were trying to build the green line. That's right. Yeah. And there's certain, I mean, you know, anytime you're building anything adjacent to an existing operating rail line, you, you have some inefficiencies. You got to stop work every time a train comes by. Just a certain, it's just a different dynamic. And then, you know, A, there was less trains and even some days, some periods we had no trains. There were some windows of time where MBTA commuter rail operations stopped. And, you know, again, no one would have ever wanted that, but because we kind of had that opportunity, it was, it was a bit of, of an opportunity we wouldn't have had otherwise. Terrific. All I can say is this, all during the pandemic, the only loud construction noise that could be heard in my entire neighborhood was the work that was going on on the Green Line. There were no road closures because of gas line work or yeah. uh, street paving or a lot of stuff that we're used to hearing. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we're used to hearing, those of us who live near the commuter rail, is the horn of the commuter rail going through. And mm -hmm. that decreased precipitously during pandemic. Mm -hmm. You got through it three months. I'm not going to let you forget it. Three months late. That's fair. So we talked about erecting a statue to you if you came in under budget and on time. Okay. The statue is halfway built. Okay. You may be able to make up more time for the next five stations. What's to come? You now have a plan. Um, I would say you want to put a percentage on it. What percentage is done for the next five stations? A lot. Um, an awful lot. If... Uh... I mean, if I had to say percentage of the next five, I'd say probably 80 to 85%. I mean, what, what, what has happened so far is <clears throat> for all those five, the bulk of the heavy lifting, you know, all the civil work, all the structural steel work is in, all the, all the sort of the, the things that really catch the eye as you walk by the stations are, are there. Um, what, what is remaining and what it takes 
a lot, more, not a lot more time, but a lot of time, and is not always as obvious is all the sort of, all the electrical work and the subsequent testing of the electrical systems. I mean, you don't see that. It's not quite as exciting to see and dynamic to, to kind of the passing observer. Um, but it's a ton of work, a ton of work. I mean, there's, there's hundreds of miles of cable to pull and that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, while that is not as obvious, it definitely takes time. So that's what's going to be happening kind of from now until we open those next five stations. Are we pretty much done, John? Uh, I notice a lot with the bridge reconstruction that there was a lot of utility work that had to go because some of those utilities ran underneath mm -hmm. the bridges. Mm -hmm. Are we pretty much done with those at this point? The utility work is, uh, well, let's see. So there's two bridges that remain impacted by, by our project. One is the Medford Street Bridge right next to the high school, and the other one's also next to the high school, School Street Bridge. The Medford Street Bridge, all utilities are done. We should be opening that here uh, in the next few weeks. School Street does still have some utility work to be done. Um, we've coordinated a lot with the Somerville first responders to make sure, you know, first responders can get through there if they need to, fire trucks and ambulances, things of that nature. Um, but as far as opening to the public, we'll probably keep that closed a little while longer while we finish up the utility works. I want to stay with um, School <coughs> Street, the high school, yep. City Hall, that whole complex that was being redone. People are amazed that the high school and the GLX and the community path were all being built at the same time. You want to talk about some of the challenges you had there with the new high school? Yeah, I mean, you're exactly right. That was a huge concern of, of, of mine and just the project team, and I'm sure the same was true for the, the high school project team. I mean, anytime you're building anything next to, to two different things concurrently, there's all kinds of opportunities for, for risk and conflict and people battling over the same space. And I got to give credit to both the GLX contractor and the, the high school contractor. I mean, yeah, we had kind of moments where we had to kind of like sort through who owns what driveway and who's occupying, who's using the crane site that day. But, um, you know. But no fist fights. No <laughs> fist fights that I'm aware of. Not to say it didn't happen. But it was really remarkable. Uh, and now the high school is where it is. I and mean, there's still a lot of work going on on the, on the, on the, on the city hall part, sure. of the, part of the site there. Yeah. Uh, and we're still working, obviously. But I think, you know, knock on something hard, we are, um, we are definitely kind of the, the most challenging part of that interface, I think, is behind us. And it's been really come out well. Yeah, it appears to me the older part of the high school that they're going to try to rehab, um, I don't even know if the city has money to do that. So that might remain stagnant for a while, and by that time, you guys are out of there. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk a little bit. So you think you're at about the 80%, 85% range of okay. completion. Mm -hmm. um, you have now given an estimate to um, the state and your bosses and the cities. You're looking at some time in late summer. Late summer, are you optimistic that it could be late July, or are you more late August? So summer technically goes into September, just to be clear. Um, <laughs> hedging that one, hedging that one. And that, at the moment, you know, we have to get through, I mean, there's, there's, as everyone saw in branch one, there's a substantial, I'll call it testing season, once we start putting trains on the tracks. And, um, you know, until we get to that point, and can really test the systems. And we can do a lot of testing without the trains, but then putting the train vehicles on the tracks really kind of is the, is the missing link of the testing plan. And until we can do that, um, we, I, I kind of want to reserve the, 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 the hedging and betting on, on time frames. But definitely we think this summer, mid to late summer, is what we're shooting for. So I'm interested from my standpoint, how do you do your punch list? So one, you've got two stations open. Mm -hmm. Are you doing a punch list of things on those stations as they come online? Oh, yeah. Or do you wait until the entire system no. is up? <clears throat> no, we're, we're punching out uh, the two stations. And it's not just punch list on the stations. It's punch list on, on the tracks, on the, the entire signals. System. Yeah, on yeah. all of it. So, and including, you know, people don't th recognize this as much, but we turned over two major um, vehicle maintenance facilities to the MBTA in last summer in August. Uh, substantial pieces of infra infrastructure that had their own punch list as well. So, no, we punch out kind of a as we go along. So the um, vehicle maintenance system, I assume you had to have that up and operating before mm -hmm. you start bringing your trains in because mm -hmm. you don't want a train that craps out in Leachmere and then you got to bring it all the way out to Riverside. Right. Those are fully functional, they're fully staffed, those are fully up and operating. Yep. yep. Uh, the project kind of turned those over to the operating departments uh, last summer. It was early August, uh, well before the trains could even get there. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of these islands, if you like. Um, but no, those have been those have been you know in service for you know since last summer. I was asked, and I'm not going to name the person. I was asked um, 
ask Joan about the cracks at the platform at Leechmere. Mm -hmm. I didn't see them because I didn't go, but I kind of pulled a picture up and it's a, those are the types of things that would be normal in any construction project of this mm -hmm. magnitude that you go back in, you look at your punch list and you say, okay, something happened here. Um, that's the part that they wanted me to mention. I saw cracks in the platform. I said, did you fall down? No, but okay. Um, the other thing, you know, I'm not going to address, which is something, a larger question that the city needs to address and the regional area needs to address is that anytime you have something new, like rapid transit coming into communities, there is always the risk of displacement. Mm. And that's not something that was part of this project. That's not something that you can control. Um, but there is a movement among some of the media people regionally to talk about with the advent of the Green Line, what does Somerville do, Somerville Medford do, when we have people coming in wanting to be closer to transit? What happens to those people who can no longer afford to be here? I'm sure that you've seen it before because you worked in Chicago on larger transit projects like this. Do you have any insight as to how other municipalities have been able to address it or is that something that you just kind of say, you know? I'm a project manager, I'm an engineer, but just from your, your insight. Yeah. Don't get I, yourself in trouble here. Just I, I won't, and I'm gonna kind of steer away from that question. Okay. I mean, I, I, I focus, I mean, I, the, good, the good news is, you know, I'm a true believer in public transportation, which is, I mean, A, I'm a deliverer of infrastructure, but the fact that public transit, you know, is just, is, is just you know, icing on the cake for me. Um, I recognize that there's definitely the pressures that develop you know, people want to be close to public transit. It, it changes the kind of the economic, you know, dynamic in, in the communities it comes into. Uh, I think without really knowing an awful lot about the topic, there are some tools that can be put in place to sort of mitigate some of the, call it the, 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 the adverse impacts of public transit uh, coming into communities. But I think I'll let people who are smarter than that speak to that. I try to stay away from things I don't know a whole lot about. <laughs> so. Um, We've got five more stations. Anything coming up in those five stations that could cause any delay? I think I saw something about transformers. There was something about transformers for the first couple yeah. that kind of delayed a little bit of yeah. something. Anything further down the line? That so I think what you're referring to, the, the GLX were building um, three traction power substations, which basically okay. take the power from the you know the, the 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 existing utility companies and convert it into a <clears throat> into a form of electricity that the MBTA trains can use. Um, and that's the whole catenary system yep, that's up above. Yep. So the overhead catenary system, the wires you see kind of um, suspended above the trains, is what delivers the power to the Green Line trains. Um, we had some challenges just sort of working through some 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 bugs um, on the Branch One traction power substation. There's two more up on the on the Medford branch. I think just looking One of those, John, I'm sorry, one of those is in Ball Square? One's at Ball Square and one's at Pearl Street or, or Medford Square, okay. uh, Gilman Square Station, Gilman sorry, Square. right near yeah. the high school. Um, <clears throat> compared to where we were uh, with the traction power substation in Branch 1 relative to revenue service, just from like the time dynamic, we are much further ahead um, on the two traction power substations for Branch 2 than we were for Branch 1. So I don't think that's going to be a challenge. Um, I think we, we, we learned an awful lot on the first branch traction power substation. So, so I that. understand it from a layman's term. Are those substations, are those almost like a backup, just, not just a relay system, but a backup system? If NSTAR craps out, mm -hmm. could the Green Line, stations, uh, Green Line trains still run? on that substation? No. 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 They're not they're not a backup in that nature. Now, what is redundant is the system can run, let's say we lose one of them. Okay. For example, let's say we lose the it's the Pearl Street substation, which is the one at, at Gilman Square. The system is designed to pick up the power load from the Ball Square station and the East and the sorry Red Bridge power substation to kind of bridge that gap. It's drawing in power from those. Yeah, it can. It can but but that's not that's not optimal. You know, like there's there's there's, deca def there's certainly a lack of redundancy for you at that point, uh, and you'd rather have all three running. Got it. Got it. So if it's a major power outage in all of New England, everybody's dead in the water on that one. We'd, we'd all be enduring the same problem. Yeah, we'd be back walking and biking. <laughs> right. So thank God for bike lanes. Sorry guys. Um, Let's move on to Tufts University. Uh, right now, that's slated to be the end of the line. Mm -hmm. 
do you think you could have some job security by convincing the, sit, the state to move it all the way up to Route 16? There's certainly a demand for that. I mean, we heard an awful lot about that at the, at the event on Monday. Um, you know, I'm, as I said a minute ago, I'm a huge fan of public transit anywhere and anytime. And I, whether, if that's not just for job security, but you know, if there's a, if there's a case to be made for taking it to Route 16, which it sounds like some people certainly think there is, I, I'd be all for it. Yeah. I think it's, you know, it's, it, it appears as though to the layman's mind, that would be the natural end of the line before you start getting into mm -hmm. Medford, uh, West Medford Square mm -hmm. and beyond. Mm -hmm. And then there's, you give me one piece of candy, I want another piece of candy. There's the whole movement of let's take it from Union Square, parallel out west, mm -hmm. uh, parallel, running parallel to probably Mass Ave. Mm -hmm. way it would run out there, get it out to Alewife or mm -hmm. someplace mm -hmm. like that. Those are much larger projects that need a lot of planning and need a, little, a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So, you know, 23 years later, or however many years you want to say, 23, 25 years later, um, we have a green line that, um, you know, I was very pleased to see John at the podium on Monday's opening. Um, it wasn't just elected officials who couldn't find Union Square on a map 25 years ago. It was um, people who actually made this work. And I, I want to thank you and I want to thank a couple of other speakers who spoke so eloquently about the men and women who actually were in the trenches, who were laying the tracks, who were you know, designing stations, putting these things up. But John, not flattering you, I give you a lot of credit. That was a magnificent way to deliver a major public infrastructure because as you say, you only came on five years ago. First time you were on this show was, what did I say? April, April of 2017. Mm -hmm. So here it is and you've delivered it. Well, I, I really, I feel, I think there's two things that helped a ton that people in my role often don't have the, the benefit of. First and foremost, um, there was almost universal support for this project. I mean, rarely, if, in fact, I, I can almost say almost never, did I have a conversation in the public um, where someone said, why, why are you doing that project? What a waste of money. I mean, no, and, 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 and whether you were you know, just a, a potential rider in the future, whether you were a butter who was living with you know, the nights and the banging and the streets closures and the dirt, people wanted it enough to endure that. And, often, and that's just not, you don't always get that. Mm -hmm. The second huge benefit was there, were just, there was so much support from sort of the, the upper chain of command. Of, of mine, um, the boards of both the MBTA and MassDOT, uh, and 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 going up upward, um, there was just so much support. And you know, if you have both of those two entities, the public and sort of the governance structure, both just doing nothing but things to, other than help trying to help you get it done, you, you're, you're just set up for success. It's called teamwork. Yeah. I mean, you mm -hmm. managed a huge team of contractors, government officials. Um, people just doing the the day-to-day -day work so congratulations to you this is not going to be the last time hopefully because we got five more stations to go John I'm not gonna let you forget that I won't forget it John Dalton knows exactly why I'm saying it because I live right next to the Lowell Street tea stop congratulations again anything else before we sign off thanks for having me back and I'll come back again when we get the next five done all right if you'll have me next five by late summer we'll keep you updated I want to thank my guest, John Dalton. John is the general manager for the GLX extension. Until next time, I will be back sooner rather than later. Until next time, please stay safe, stay informed. We'll see you soon.